So here's a math question. How many ways can you vary a three nucleotide long sequence when each position in that sequence can only come from one of four different nucleotides? Adenosine, guanosine, cytidine, and uridine. Do you know the answer? Of course you do. You guessed it. The answer is four times four times four, which equals 64. So what this number means is that there are actually 64 different kinds of tRNA, one for each possible three nucleotide long anticodon sequence. Each of these 64 different tRNAs carries, attached to the muzzle of its gun, a different amino acid. Well, sort of. <laughs> You might remember from chapter 23 that there are really only 20 different most common amino acids used in protein synthesis. As I'm sure you're aware, the number 20 is much smaller than the number 64. So how can there be 64 different kinds of tRNAs, each attached to a different amino acid, if there are only 20 amino acids to pick from? The answer is simple. Redundancy. So here's how that actually works. How the nucleotide by nucleotide language found in mRNA is converted into amino acid language. And I really can't speak highly enough of the people who made these discoveries Marshall Nirenberg, Har Gobind Korana, and Robert Hawley. Once again, following DNA transcription, the newly formed mRNA is brought into the ribosome complex and read three nucleotides at a time. The ribosome then ushers in a tRNA whose anticodon is complementary to that three nucleotide sequence in the mRNA. So let's look at our mRNA here. This example that I've uh, kind of stolen from the book, you'll notice that the first three nucleotide long sequence, which is called a codon, is AGC. Now of all the 64 different tRNAs that exist floating around in the cell near the ribosome during translation. There's only one tRNA whose anticodon is complementary to AGC. And that would be the mRNA or the tRNA whose anticodon is UCG. That particular tRNA will have attached to its muzzle a specific corresponding amino acid. Now, which amino acid is that? Well, to figure that out, we just have to look at this table. So I have A, G, C in my memory RNA. If I look up at the table, I'm going to look at nucleotide A, and then I'm going to go to G. G is over here in the third most column, and then I'm going to go down to the letter C, which is right here. You'll notice that that amino acid is serine. What that means is that as this mRNA dragged down the ribosome, a tRNA whose anticodon is complementary to this, that is, the tRNA will have an anticodon that says UCG, will have a serine dangling off of the end of it. That serine, once that tRNA is brought into place, will be released from the tRNA and added to the growing peptide chain. The next three nucleotide long sequence in our mRNA is CUU. What amino acid does that correspond to? I look at the table, C, U, and then I go down here, U. It's leucine. See that? What that means is that there is a tRNA that would be complementary to this. In other words, the tRNA's anticodon would say GAA on it, and it would have dangling off of the muzzle of it a leucine molecule that would be added next onto the polypeptide chain. This would continue down the sequence until we got to the last three nucleotide long sequence here, a GAA. What amino acid does GAA correspond with? Well, I look at the table, G, I look at the column A, and then I go here to A. It corresponds to glutamic acid. So once again, there is a tRNA that would fit into a GAA hole, that is, it would have an anticodon complementary to it that would read CUU. And that tRNA would have dangling off of the other end of it a glutamic acid residue that would be added to the growing polypeptide chain. That is how the mRNA language, which is written in nucleotides, is translated into actual protein language, which is written in amino acids. 
Now you might remember me talking earlier about redundancy. And it is exemplified in, for example, you can see that the sequence UUU codes for phenylalanine. UUC also codes for phenylalanine. You can see that UCU codes for serine, as does UCC, UCA, and UCG. So you see there's a lot of redundancy built into this system. Even though there are 64 different tRNA molecules, Several of those, according to this table, actually do the exact same thing. That is, they'll have the same amino acid dangling off of them, or in the case of UAA or UAG or UGA, they will code for stop codons. What does that mean? It tells the ribosome that that is where it should stop making the protein. At that juncture, the ribosome will disassemble, release the mRNA into solution, and uh, also release the peptide or protein. The protein then goes into the cytoplasm from where it can be further modified or used as needed. I hope that all makes sense. I'm going to show you a little bit more information momentarily that might help clarify it even more. To recap, when our cell needs to make a protein, what it does is it opens up the segment of DNA found in the chromosome stored in its nucleus that code for that specific protein. It then brings in a collection of enzymes that take that segment of DNA, which is called, and makes a complementary segment of RNA that corresponds with that segment of DNA. This process is called transcription because we're going from one language into an exact copy or complementary copy of the same language, which is nucleotide. Messenger RNA is then taken outside of the nucleus and it's put into a collection of enzymatic machinery called the ribosome. And the ribosome then brings in these molecules called tRNA or transfer RNA. Each transfer RNA, re the mRNA strand three nucleotides at a time. When the tRNA finds a hole that it fits in, the amino acid that that particular tRNA has dangling off of it is added to the growing peptide chain. That continues until a codon in the mRNA called a stop codon is found. Once that occurred, the peptide or protein is released into the cytoplasm, after which it can be further modified or used according to the cell's needs. The ribosome complex, the mRNA, is taken into solution to be digested and recycled. Now I realize that this figure we're looking at is a little more complex than is probably necessary, much like our IRS tax laws. But I hope you get the idea. And as you probably anticipated, here's one last video from the DNA Learning Center that shows how translation occurs. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Then, in a dazzling display of choreography, all the components of a molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. Each transfer molecule carries a three-letter code that is matched with the RNA in the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, the end product is hemoglobin, 
The cells in our bone marrow churn out a hundred trillion molecules of it per second. And as a result, our muscles, brain, and all the vital organs in our body receive the oxygen they need.